All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us for the session. Welcome. And we wanted to come together today uh, for this panel entitled Asian Pacific American Experiences Highlighted Through Arts and History in that uh, it's Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. My name is Ed Tepporn and I'm the Executive Director of the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation. And I would like to start by respectfully acknowledging that the immigration station sits on the lands of the Coast Miwok Indians. I also want to uplift that last month, the month of April, was National Arab American Heritage Month. And then this month, as we're celebrating Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, this is typically a time when Asian Pacific Islander communities come together to remember and honor the histories, the journeys, the stories that our diverse communities of over 50 different ethnic groups that speak 100 different languages and dialects have traveled here in the US. But unfortunately, this year, we are recognizing Asian Pacific American Heritage Month under the shadows and the specter of a huge increase in anti-Asian and anti-immigrant attacks. And so perhaps more now than ever, it is especially important for all of us to come together and continue to learn and to understand and empathize about the diverse journeys that Asians and Pacific Islanders have traveled here to the US and our ongoing contributions to this country. I'm so proud to stand in solidarity with our brother and sister museums that are part of the Migration Museums Network and who are fellow members of the International Coalition of the Sites of Conscience. And that's why I am also excited and thrilled to, to introduce uh, our next person who's going to be giving some brief welcome remarks, who's Gigi Joseph. She is an architect and urbanist. She's a set and production designer, and she's a museologist. She's currently the Senior Program Manager at the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience, where she oversees the coalition's activities in Africa, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Gigi also leads much of the, global, the coalition's global thematic work, including the Migration Museums Network. And I wanna give it a special thank you to Gigi for joining us because it, she's joining us from Johannesburg and it is almost midnight there. So Gigi, thank you. And I will pull up your slides. Thank you so much, Ed. It's uh, such a pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good afternoon. Um, a big thank you again, as Ed said, to the North American members of Sites of Conscience and the Migration Museums Network for putting together this webinar on Asian Pacific American experiences highlighted through art and history. Uh, for those of you who are not so familiar, familiar with the coalition, the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience is the only global network of historic sites, museums, and memory initiatives that connect past struggles to today's movements of human rights and social justice. It was founded in 1999. Uh, we now have over 300 members in more than 65 countries from Ellis Island in New York City to former centers of detainment in Argentina, uh, to sites that remember and learn from the transatlantic slave trade in West Africa. We support these sites in a variety of ways, including grants, networking, joint programs, and training workshops um, like this one, and uh, opportunities for people to meet and exchange experiences and ideas. Uh, so if you want to know more about us, please visit our website at sitesofconscience.org. So please, next slide, Ed. So Sites of Conscience are extremely diverse uh, or uh, is a network of extremely diverse organizations, uh, public, private, big, small, uh, government-led or, or uh, grassroots. And they are united by their shared commitment to four operational principles, which is they interpret history through sight, they engage the public in programs that stimulate dialogue on press and social issues, they share opportunities for public involvement and positive action on the issues um, that are raised at their sites, and they promote justice and universal cultures of human rights. Um, but please, uh, next one, Ed. So today we operate clustered into both regional and thematic uh, sub-networks. We have, uh, in terms of regional networks today, uh, we have six regions, uh, as you see on the screen, Africa with 31 members in 13 countries, Asia, 23 members in 10 countries, Europe, 40 members in 19 countries, Middle East and North Africa, MENA, 23 members in 11 countries, 
uh, North America, 150 members in two countries, and Latin America and the Caribbean, 14, eight members and growing in 13 countries. And these numbers, I, I'm pretty sure they're a bit outdated. It's been growing uh, a lot, actually, over the last year. Interestingly, with all the pandemic, we, we gained a whole lot of new members. Um, so our members work together around common interests within these sub-networks. They work cross-regionally as well. And they also come together as a global network to share and exchange knowledge and discuss themes of global relevance. So next one, please, Ed. So the Migration Museums Network is our first established thematic network, and it has been operating since 2019. Uh, it has today uh, over 23 members in 17 countries throughout Africa, Asia and the Pacific, Europe, Latin America and the Caribbean and North America. It's a network of museums that is, it's, it's specifically museums interested in coming together to share experiences, projects, and support the practices of museums working with migration, which is such a, such a complex theme. It is also a network interested in connecting to non-migrant museums to that are discussing migration and learn from a variety of experiences that can support museums navigating the complexity of topics that inform and shape migration in departure and arri arrival places, past and present. The Migration Museums Network also wants to raise awareness about museums as shapers of narrative discourses and as well as position museums as places where stories are welcome and that people can feel recognized. So because of that, uh, they also want to consider migration topics through a wider lens and acknowledge the need to recognize migrants as an inter integral actors to museum making process. So with that, I'll pass the word back to Ed and um, thank you again for, for being here and thank you. Thank you so much, Gigi. And we are so proud, all of us, to be part of the Migration Museums Network. It truly has been wonderful to learn about our common humanity from the work that we're all doing together and look forward to the continued collaboration. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the other organizations that are the US members uh, and who are represented on today's panel. Uh, not all of us will be speaking. We actually made a conscious effort in solidarity to reduce the number of speakers so that uh, those of us who had a larger connection to Asian Pacific Islander history and arts could have more of an opportunity to share with you some of the work that we've been doing. But I, I definitely want to acknowledge our brothers and sisters at the Arab American National Museum in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island National Monument in New York, the Tenement Museum also in New York, and uh, of course you will have the opportunity to hear from Angel Island, uh, both the Foundation as well as the State Park, and our colleagues uh, at the Wing Luke Museum in Seattle, Washington. Uh, we do have a welcome video from the Arab American National Museum. And so if you'll give me just a few seconds, I will pull that up so that we can have a moment to, to have the opportunity to hear from, from uh, our brothers and sisters there. And we'll be hearing from uh, Diana, who is uh, one of the, uh, the directors of the museums. Hello, my name is Diana Abahadi and I'm the director of the Arab American National Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. Uh, and I wish to wish everybody a very happy Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. The Arab American National Museum is the only museum of its kind in the United States. Our mission is to document, promote and preserve the history, culture and contributions of Arab Americans. Um, we are a proud member of the International Sites of Conscience, as well as a member of its Migration Museums Network. We are a young museum, only 16 years old, and it was to Asian American museums, such as the Japanese American National Museum and the Wing Luke Museum, that we turned to for inspiration and guidance when our museum was still an idea and, it was in, and we were in our planning stages. So we owe much to those museums that came before us, before us that set the stage and the standards for excellence um, in museum practice when representing communities um, such as ours and such as the Asian American community. Um, while our museum does not identify as Asian Pacific American, our communities do share much in the way of common histories and experiences as well as mutual solidarity. The Arab American community was heartened very much by the strong support and solidarity shown by Asian Americans in the aftermath of the 2017 Muslim ban, which severely limited movement of some 
of citizens of some Arab countries into the United States. Uh, the Arab American National Museum stood in solidarity with our Asian brothers and sisters over the last year as the country saw a serious uptick in hate crimes and bigotry against members of the Asian American community. We are emboldened by the new hate crimes bill that was signed yesterday by President Biden, which expands efforts to prosecute perpetrators of hate and bigotry against Asian Americans. Um, again, I just want to say very happy uh, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month and um, I look forward to wishing you many more. Thank you. And, and, and thank you, Diana, for, for that wonderful welcome message. I've had the opportunity to, to visit the National Arab American Museum a few times, and it truly is wonderful that we have a museum that celebrates Arab American and Middle Eastern communities here in the US. So if you've never had a chance to visit, you've got to make your way to Dearborn uh, once COVID-19 safety protocols allow us all to travel a little bit more. So just to give you an idea of what to expect for the rest of today's time together, I'll be sharing a little bit about some of the historic racism and xenophobia that has impacted Asian Pacific American communities here in the US. I'll then turn it over to my colleague, Casey Dexter Lee, who will tear, talk a little bit more about the specific history of Angel Island and the role it played in US immigration. And then finally, we'll turn it over to Rahul Gupta from the Wing Luke Museum, who is gonna talk about some of the art that is displayed at the Wing Luke, but also the importance of cross-racial solidarity. And then we'll wrap things up with an opportunity for discussion. As we go along today, if you have any questions and answers for any of us, please feel free to use the question and answer box to enter that question in and we'll try to get to all your questions. Uh, in the meantime, we'll go ahead and kick it off now. And uh, what I wanted to start off with for my portion of the presentation is this recognition that over the past uh, year, year and a half, we've definitely seen some horrific rhetoric impacting Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. And we've seen some horrific attacks uh, that have primarily been targeted towards Asian elders and Asian women. And what's been really frustrating as someone who identifies as an Asian immigrant is that some people have argued whether or not some of these attacks are actually racist. Some people have thought of these as a new trend or a new occurrence. But for those of us who are Asian Pacific Islander, we know that this history of of anti-Asian racism and xenophobia traces back for many years, for generations, to the time when Asian Pacific Islander immigrants first started coming to the US. And that's what is symbolized by the, the imagery and the art that you see on this slide. These are some renderings uh, that remind us that in the eight, middle 1800s, when Chinese laborers started coming to the US, first to help uh, search for gold in the California hills, and then later to help build the Transcontinental Railroad. After those two projects were completed, as they returned to various cities across the West Coast, they were seen as competition for labor and were thus the target of significant anti-lynching and significant riots. And in places across California, the Chinatowns were actually burned down. Unfortunately, this racism and xenophobia uh, was not relegated to just the, the physical violence, but it also uh, became part of the systemic violence that impacted Asian Pacific Islander communities, both in terms of how our communities were perceived, uh, as you see in these cartoons and stereotypes that started off being targeted perhaps to the Chinese communities, but eventually grew across other communities, such as the South Asian community that you see in the middle, uh, of the screen, as well as the Filipino community, and, and of course, across the, the diaspora of Asian Pacific Islander communities. Part of that systemic racism is that these, these laws, uh, these xenophobic racist attitudes got uh, transcribed into our nation's immigration policies and laws. And so starting with the Page Act of 1875 that tried to stereotype Chinese women as prostitutes and thus make it illegal for them to immigrate and naturalize to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which was the first time a specific country was barred from naturalizing to the US. And the Chinese Exclusion Act was just the beginning of a series of laws and acts that over the course of the next several decades, essentially created a barrier for almost all Asian Pacific Islander countries from coming to the US, as well as from naturalizing to become US citizens. 
There are many other examples of both the violent as well as systemic forms of racism and xenophobia. Uh, what you see on this screen is how we think of Hawaii now as this beautiful state to visit with lush beaches and delicious food. Um, and it's the 50th state in the US. But what we don't often get taught in school is that Hawaii was a sovereign nation before it became part of the US. and in, the Hawaiian monarchy was actually overthrown by a US government backed group of business owners. For those of us who studied uh, or, or grew up learning in, in American schools, perhaps one of the few pieces of Asian Pacific Islander history in America that we did learn about uh, was the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. And so, as many of you know, in 1942, Executive Order 9066 uh, led to the forced removal of over 120,000 Japanese and Japanese Americans. But what we often don't talk about is the economic toll, uh, how families lost their homes, their businesses, their livelihoods when they were incarcerated unjustly. Another part of history that we often also don't learn about is that after World War II, the US government conducted a series of nuclear tests in the Marshall Islands, which are uh, a US affiliated Pacific Island jurisdiction. And one experiment in particular, the Castle Bravo test was over 1000 times the nuclear power of the bombs that our military and our government dropped on um, on Hiroshima, which in and of itself was a huge injustice. Uh, that bomb in the Marshall Islands has la had lasting repercussions in terms of the usability of that land, as well as the health conditions of the Marshallese population. A little bit more recently, these are just two examples of, of unfortunate violent attacks, one against Vincent Chin in, in Detroit, Michigan, who uh, was beat to death by two Detroit auto workers. Um, and this occurred a week before he was scheduled to get married. Uh, and Vincent Chin's death is often seen by many of us in the Asian Pacific Islander community as one of the rallying moments when our community saw beyond our countries of origin and, and recognized the importance of coming together for critical mass to push for civil rights and safety for our communities. Similarly, in 1999, uh, Filipino-American postal worker Joseph Alito was violently killed in Los Angeles by a white supremacist. And, and these are just two examples of the lives that we've lost and that have been impacted by anti-Asian violence and by xenophobia. Uh, what we've also seen is, especially after 9-11, South Asians, Arab Americans, Muslims, and Sikhs uh, have been the target of significant hate crimes and discrimination. Uh, in August of 2012, there was a gunman who entered a Sikh Gurdwara and shot to death six victims in a place of, of religious significance, in a place of worship. Uh, and so uh, what is important to note too, is that in the years since 9-11, there have been continued incidents of documented violence uh, targeted towards South Asians, Arab Americans, Muslims, and Sikhs. And it's important to remember that those, docu those documented incidents are probably just the tip of the iceberg. And of course, we've also seen the recent attacks in Atlanta and Indianapolis. And so I bring these up in, in the importance of recognizing that these types of anti-Asian racism and xenophobia are not new. They have a long history in the US uh, across time. And part of that history is the systemic injustices and systemic racism that led to the creation of the US immigration station at Angel Island. And so I want to now invite my colleague and friend, Casey Dexter Lee, to share a little bit more about the history of Angel Island. And Casey truly is well equipped uh, to, to speak to you about this history in that she has lived and worked on Angel Island for the past 20 years. So Casey, over to you. Thank you so much, Ed. Uh, so I'm an interpreter with California State Parks and I work here on Angel Island. And Angel Island's in the middle of San Francisco Bay. If you're standing in San Francisco looking north, we are just behind that more famous island Alcatraz that many of you have probably heard of. Uh, but Angel Island is the largest island in San Francisco Bay. 
and was a military base for many years. And so a little part of the northern side of the island was carved out as an immigration station in the early 1900s and opened in 1910 after a small city was built here with all the different elements that were required to uh, for the government to take over the housing of immigrants that were being detained. Now, pr this is, of course, the era um, very similar to what was happening at Ellis Island, where uh, people coming into the United States didn't have many or any requirements to fulfill before arriving here. So people would show up and we started having laws in the US that slowed or stopped the entry of certain groups of people. So Angel Island was built to help enforce the Chinese exclusion laws. Uh, prior to this facility opening, when ships arrived, immigrants that were detained were held on the, the very ship they traveled on until that ship had to depart to another destination. So they would move people from boat to boat um, to create housing for them. Uh, and then the next step was a shed a, a warehouse on the waterfront in San Francisco uh, became the housing for people being detained. So in 1910, Angel Island opens in the newspaper, they call it the finest immigrant station in the world. Um, but that was a bit of an overstatement. This facility had a lot of shortcomings and within two years was uh, doing major renovations to try and improve the conditions and the health conditions for the people being detained here. So I'm actually inside of the detention barracks, uh, which is uh, the most significant building on the site. And I'll turn my camera here so you can see down into this room. This room, uh, the space that you can see is the Chinese men's barracks. And there were multiple rooms for Chinese men. Uh, there was segregation here into three categories, racial categories, European, Asian, and Chinese. Now, of course, China is part of Asia, but because of the separate Chinese exclusion laws and the second largest group after the Chinese being uh, Japanese immigrants, uh, Asian and Chinese immigrants were considered separately here on Angel Island. European was uh, code for white. Most of the Europeans coming here were actually Russians from the continent of Asia. So this room for Chinese men, uh, the space that we can see from here, were considered healthy for 25 people. And the number of beds in the space was 100. And so we have reproduction beds in the um, museum right now. And if you want to see how you climb up, basically you just step on the beds of the people below you to go up. There's no ladders um, other than stepping on the beds. And these beds uh, weren't always full because of the nature of arriving by ship. People are coming and going. So if a bed was unoccupied, you could remove the bedding and the mattress, fold this bed into an upright position where it locks and have a little more space in the room. There's a small open space at the far end of the room, but otherwise this is filled with beds. And you can actually see worn into the floor. It's a little discolored here because there were so few places to walk. The floor is worn away from people walking up and down these narrow rows. Now, when the facility first opened, all immigrants um, from about 80 different countries around the world were given a mattress, blanket, and pillow, except for Chinese men. They were not given mattresses, and there were a lot of stereotypes, biases, misunderstandings about the culture um, from, uh, on behalf of the Americans. So because sleeping mats are something that people use in the summertime, especially in certain parts of China, the American officials thought that the Chinese men wouldn't want mattresses. Well, I don't know if you can see under here, but this is actually metal. And um, this reproduction has a little less give than the historic with a little more spring to it. But you're sleeping on a metal bed with a blanket and a pillow was probably very uncomfortable. And to further kind of drive home the people were being treat treated differently from one another is Chinese women that work here although a very small number compared to men, about seven men for every one woman, Chinese women were given mattresses. So I don't know where the American immigration officials thought Chinese women were sleeping that was so different from Chinese men, but the probably overriding stereotypes of about women um, needing you know, nicer, more comfortable things were prevailing in the attitudes of that era. So when the Chinese men found out everyone else had mattresses and they did not, they protested. And the Chinese community actually had a very long history 
of fighting for their rights here in the United States. Uh, going all the way back to the gold rush when laws started being passed to restrict the ability of Chinese people in the US to work, um, have access to things, testify in court, uh, go to school, uh, time and time again, the Chinese community would work together to try and fight for their rights. And often in courts, they would find some success. So that uh, idea of protest, of standing up for their rights continued here. And so Chinese men were given mattresses. And there was a similar process with the food. All food at first uh, was very European style, stews, all the things mixed together. Um, and the Chinese immigrants wanted food that was more familiar. And so they protested. Now, from the Chinese immigrant uh, perspective, this was a, a protest. Uh, they refused to leave the dining hall until conditions improved. From the perspective of the immigration officials, it was a food riot. And they had to bring in the army to get things back under control. Well, in reality, the army is actually on the rest of the island. So it was just next a few uh, hundred feet away. They asked for some army uh, soldiers to come over and assist with returning people to their bunks. So food did improve, but there were still a lot of complaints about the quality of the food. Uh, and one of the uh, other ways that people were able to protest here was to fight against the very difficult entry hearing process. Um, many of the people coming through here were coming under an exemption to the Chinese exclusion law that allowed for children of American citizens to enter. And so uh, one of the ways you could prove you're a child of an American citizen is to uh, compare your, the answers that you gave to a series of questions to generally your father that was already here in the United States. Well, a lot of people were um, creating those relationships, the paper sons and paper daughters were uh, taking on false identities to be able to get around the racist exclusion laws of the era. And so they would memorize information about a family and village they were supposed to be from. And sometimes you might have a hard time remembering all that information. But even people telling the truth would have difficulty with these questions. How many chickens does your neighbor have? What's the flooring like in your kitchen? Uh, what's the shape of the chair that you sit at when you eat your meals? Uh, who lives in the third row in the fourth house in your village? How many windows does your home have? And so if you weren't able to answer all of these questions, you might be able to get word to a cook. So those Chinese cooks working here became a conduit to pass information back and forth between the mainland. And for a fee, they could find out the answer, bring that back to you, have it passed through a network of the Chinese, uh, or excuse me, the Angel Island Liberty Association, which was an organization within the Chinese community here to um, get access to lawyers, access to information. So I wanna point out some of the writing here, which is how we know a lot of uh, the information about the experience of immigrants on Angel Island. And poems and other inscriptions are found here on the walls carved into the wood. So the English translation for this one right here, a very emotion packed poem, says a thousand sorrows and a hatred 10,000 fold burns between my brows. Hoping to step ashore the American continent is the most difficult of difficulties. The barbarians imprison me in this place. Even a martyr or a hero would change countenance. So we can really hear um, the anger, frustration, um, and defiance in this poem. But there's poetry about every aspect of this process, the long journey on the ship, the bad food, the invasive medical exams, the long waits, the separation from family. Um, and there are poems that encompass those um, darker feelings of anger, despair, frustration, but there are also poems of hope. And so we hope that um, when you have the opportunity, you are able to come and visit the park and learn a little more. We'll also have some questions at the end if there's anything else you'd like to know. So I'm gonna turn things over to the Wing Luke Museum and uh, Raul Gupta is going to kick us off for there. Thank you, Casey. Um, good afternoon, everyone, uh, or evening or morning, depending on where you are, now that I know that Gigi is in uh, Johannesburg, um, <clears throat> which I just 
you win. <laughs> That's dedication. Uh, my name is Rahul. I'm the Education and Tour Director at the uh, uh, Wingwick Museum of the Asian Pacific American Experience. We've been around for over 50 years, focusing on migration stories of uh, first Chinese, Chinese Americans. And in that time, we have expanded into the only uh, national Pan-Asian American Museum uh, in the United States. We do this through a combination of storytelling, immersive, immersion, dialogic engagement, but also community advisory process. So where most museums would have a curator, we don't. We actually have very skilled exhibit uh, uh, staff, but they work with committees of community members around particular topics, whether it's ethnic specific or topic specific, like um, uh, food, uh, contributions to food and uh, Pacific Northwest cuisine or um, my favorite was uh, the sci-fi exhibit. Uh, being a, a sci-fi nerd myself, uh, it was wonderful to step into a room where, you know, my Star Wars sheets are on the bed. Well, they weren't mine, but they're still at my parents' house. I have them from when I was a kid in the 70s. And um, to just really see uh, something that felt like home. So then it raises the question, where do museums play a role in grounding an individual, not only in who they are, but in understanding who is around them, who has connections, whether historically or contemporary connections, um, but then also to realize that there's a legacy and a series of legacies of solidarity, of connections, of reconciliation, of confrontation, of resistance and outright rebellion, which feed the Pacific Northwest story in ways that most uh, Americans, and I don't mean just white Americans when I say uh, American, I mean all Americans. Uh, it was interesting. We had a visit from a very prominent uh, government official the other day on Monday. It was the first time that a motorcade had ever come to the museum that I remember uh, with uh, an armed security detail. I won't tell you who came, but um, we had a pretty blunt conversation and I thought uh, I was pretty impressed with this particular individual's um, candor, frankly, and uh, made me feel better about uh, some of the people who are being put into positions right now. Uh, given the uh, disastrous last four years. And I, I mean that, I don't mean that uh, politically in sort of that partisan sense. But in terms of understanding uh, fundamental values of change, and I don't mean American values. American values do include white supremacy, period. And I do not mean that. But there are very clear moments in time where people, maybe not politicians, maybe not the rich, maybe not the powerful, but people have set for us to follow. And um, I'm, uh, Ed, can I, I'm able to share my screen? She should be able to. Okay, great. And I wanna talk a little bit about those values. Um, so this wasn't working. Ah, can you all see it? Victor, this wasn't working yesterday. Um, those values that go into addressing what we have seen as sort of dual pandemics, pandemic of racism, pandemic of COVID-19, and the racism that that has returned up. I spoke a little bit about the history of that, but for most of our populations, uh, I can't speak for every individual, but our populations have experienced this. This is nothing new. But it begs the question, why haven't, why haven't things changed? And to some extent, our museum becomes a, a place to uh, engage in these, in what we call the new dialogue, new dialogues initiatives. And it's a particular gallery, it's a free part of our museum. Anybody can walk in off the street 
and it poses uh, at any time, whichever ex exhibition is in there, uh, poses some hard questions that people can then almost reinterpret all the objects and, and, and uh, archives and oral histories in the museum itself. So at any time, we are creating additional lenses through which the public can engage. So I wanna talk about black, brown solidarity because <clears throat> personally, I didn't grow up here. I grew up in New Jersey and in Texas, very different places. <laughs> um, by the time I get to Texas, I've already had this connection with just about every walk of life coming out of Jersey. When I get to Texas, we are one of three families of color total in our neighborhood. It turns out that the Grand Wizard, ex-Grand Wizard of the KKK, hmm, lived four blocks from our house and we spent the next five years in Houston terrorized. Well, who was standing by us? Black people, Latino people, some white European Americans, very few other Indian Americans like myself. It was a really interesting time, but it made it so. I didn't really understand that there wasn't solidarity amongst our peoples until I left Houston and we went to Dallas and the world, uh, well, I was also younger, but as I grew older, I came to understand. Well, coming to Seattle, we start to understand that our stories do not live in a vacuum. I am sitting on former Duwamish and Coast Salish territory. The land was called the land of bubbling water. There was a freshwater spring. There was this massive hill that went down to a waterfront, not far, like two blocks down from here, which now it's extended another six blocks towards the water. That hill is no more. It's been regraded and covered it up. But that waterfront, there were two longhouses, a couple uh, smoking uh, apparatuses, and uh, perfect. It was a tidal lagoon, easy to catch fish, clam, uh, digging. Um, oyster beds weren't right here, but they were further around. And then other groups who consumed ducks and other fowl would come here. The launch people apparently did not include that in their particular diet. But in that way, this was a place of shared resources. Well, despite what I've got in front of me, the red line, Despite the structures of segregation that were put in place, down here behind the red line, that idea that our communities were actually facing similar types of, of conditions really begins with Native Hawaiians coming uh, to Fort Vancouver and uh, uh, with the Hudson Bay Company, and that was in the 1700s. But then you have the Chinese coming up in the mid 1800s. But really by another 50 years, you have South Asian immigrants up and down the West Coast. You have Japanese immigrants and their children up and down the West Coast. Obviously you have the Chinese and their children up and down. And we start within the 1900s, start to see the, the growth of Filipino populations. Two big spurts, the teens and then the thirties. But it's behind the red line that this sort of American dichotomy, you're not white, you're black, if you're not black, you're white, falls by the wayside. Partially because our populations had to decide. I won't get into it, but every major fight against immigration laws and the right to naturalize placed first the Chinese in a situation where they were um, looking at the chat, four minutes, that was fast, um, <laughs> where uh, they actually tried to categorize themselves as being white. South Asians did it. I hear it all the time. Your people tried to call themselves white. Well, so did yours. And so on and so forth. But you see this stark racialization of, for example, Queen Lilia Filani, as well as Filipinos in the, the bottom left corner. Um, that racialization, that stereotyping, uh, we've got a mystic dude playing, you know, to a cobra, 
is. Because yeah. that's, you know, I do that all the time, by the way. Um, <laughs> but as we, uh, we stop working, as we move into the 20th century, we actually start to realize coming out of uh, World War II and the incarceration of Japanese Americans, we start to see throughout the 50s and 60s a growth of inter community uh, organizing. I show the picture of Wing Luke himself, who also fell into that category, lived in equal housing, was connected to civil rights leaders, and actually fought for equal housing here in Seattle and lost, sadly. He also believed in historic preservation, and this is actually critical for me. He believed that if you were able to raise a building to the ground, that you could effectively pretend that whoever had built that building never did it. So you lose the structure, you lose the safety of the story. When you lose the story, you can rewrite history and pretend people never contributed. In that way, our museum looks at historic preservation as a means for retaining the direct lineage of stories uh, shared by African-American people, Latinos, so on and so forth. Here we have Tyree Scott on the left, uh, Cindy Domingo and Michael Wu. They worked uh, through an organization called LILO, and that was a labor um, employment uh, organization that fought for pretty much the democratization and the uh, desegregation of unions. But they also worked side by side with other individuals. We have Bernie White Bear on the lower left, Uncle Bob Santos, Roberto Maestas, and Larry Gossett. Now these four became friends for many years, but behind the red line, our museum turns up in the 1960s with a very well-established idea that we're not gonna win freedoms standing alone. And I don't have time to go into all the stories of solidarity, but they're extensive. Um, some of the, the ones that I wanted to point out, um, Mike Tagawa is up on the right-hand corner. Mike uh, was one of several Japanese American um, members of the Black Panther Party. Uh, one of the others I didn't choose on purpose ended up being an FBI uh, informant. So we left him out, but Mike, Mike's, Mike's good. Uh, to the left, we have uh, artists in New York City, uh, Godzilla down below, black, uh, brown and black pride. And then, of course, these are the parents of our current uh, uh, vice president. Brings us to how do you use the current pandemic of COVID, looking at the other pandemic of racism, Black Lives Matter, anti-Asian American violence, and put those together. We start with oral histories and partnering with the University of Washington School of Public Health and their students who are now distance learning because of COVID. They conduct a series of oral histories which form the foundation for an exhibition um, entitled uh, Community Spread, Surviving uh, a Pandemic. And I'm not gonna read all the questions at the top, but um, if this is gonna be shared in another time, you can see there was a, a considerable list of, of um, questions asked. <clears throat> but really what we were getting at is understanding, did that black brown solidarity kind of pass through into the current era? Because you start to see in America today, a stark distinction over, well, that's black white racism. That's other kinds of racism. That's this thing. That's that thing. That thing over here, those are the people whose families migrated here, possibly by choice, possibly as refugees, but we weren't forced here and enslaved. And yeah, those are distinct, but yet over here, we've got the people who were displaced and murdered in order for all of us to be here. So where are those histories when we start talking about racism and its complete construction? Well, how do you combat any of those racisms, at least for our communities, has been through mutual aid. And during the COVID pandemic, we had um, safety checks, uh, uh, health screenings, vaccination centers have been set up, food delivery to elders, uh, knocking on elders' doors to see if they needed anything, taking bottles of water, anything that could alleviate the quarantine and the feeling of isolation which was incredibly powerful. 
and actually let us continue to heal through this pandemic. And then coupled with the Black Lives Matter uh, protests that rocked Seattle for a long time, we had tons of people from our communities in the street. On the left, I'm showing a local newspaper and you can get a sense. Um, here we are talking about police brutality and the investigation showing several uh, serious gaps. We also have uh, coalitions. The, the woman at the top center, if anyone's in New York, she's actually uh, an assembly member. Uh, it's Yulian New, my former next door neighbor. Um, but then also the public art murals that we painted with each other. And that was a completely boom, epiphenomenal occurrence. And people just took care to save all the businesses and then beautify the neighborhood. What that did was give us this exhibition that you're seeing here. It's a combination of photographs, oral histories, um, uh, different uh, art design examples, as well as the, the shirt or the kurta that's there. I'm putting in a plug for my sister. Yeah, she'll love that. Um, it's an embroidery piece. And if you want to know more about the piece, uh, it was in the New York Times last week. Um, you should check it out. But basically, um, she ended up, every one of us in the family who received vaccinations, our names are embroidered in uh, on the shirt in band-aids. Uh, these are some of the murals that were put up around the neighborhood. Almost all speak to ending anti-Asian violence, supporting the neighborhood, protecting the neighborhood, but also supporting Black Lives Matter. Black Trans Lives Matter, for instance, with the, the photograph on the upper right, and messages of love. So where does this all um, come in together? Museums can then become the site for healing and reconciliation. For healing and reconciliation, both critical to whatever movement, whether you're coming in through migration or you've been born here. It's, an, it's been an incredible process to see this exhibition come to light. But I'll stop and we could talk more if we need to. Um, thank you. I think I took longer than I was supposed to. Thanks, Rahul. And the the images that you shared of those murals, uh, of those exhibitions, I, I love how you described how communities came together to, to curate and to cultivate those. And I also love what you raised about oral histories, especially how so many of our institutions have used oral histories, not only to document the past, but to build solidarity, to build understanding, to build empathy for, for one another's communities. I want to remind our listeners that if you have any questions for either myself, for Rahul, for Casey, or even for Gigi, please feel free to use the Q&A box to, to type in your questions. But one question um, as we get to the end of the hour, and, and um, I want to respect everyone's time and start uh, stop at the hour, uh, that I'd like to ask everyone just to perhaps respond to is that as we come to the end of Asian Pacific American Heritage Month this month, uh, hopefully that isn't the end of the, the recognition of the histories, the injustices, the contributions the Asian Pacific American communities have contributed to the US. So what are your hopes uh, in the months and, and the years ahead? Uh, and, and what do you think is needed in order to continue to build this cross-racial solidarity uh, between our different communities? And, and how might our respective sites or, or museums be doing that? Um, I'm happy to start off and, and just say that at the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation, we're the primary partner for Angel Island State Park. And so uh, one of the things that we are looking at in, in the months ahead is thinking about this very question of our oral histories. So we've documented over 250 histories of people who immigrated through Angel Island, as well as people who immigrated after Angel Island closed. And many of those oral histories really track the journey of what uh, immigrants have taken and what they've what they've had to suffer, but also their strengths and, and how they have uh, persisted, their determination. 
Uh, my hope is that as we continue to collect those oral histories, um, most of those have been written. And my hope is that we can actually start to, to video record uh, and, and hear from people in their own people's own voices, sharing those, those stories of, of what they have been through. And hopefully in doing so, just continue to build uh, that sense of understanding and empathy for immigrants then, as well as immigrants now and immigrants in the future. Uh, how about it uh, at Wing Luke or Casey at, at, for Angel Island State Park? I know that you've been there for 20 years too, right? So how do you see people reacting to uh, the emerging exhibits and uh, at, at the park? So right now we have a lot of challenges because of the pandemic and our museum space is, is closed right now. People can visit the park and the exterior of the site, but they're not able to come into the building just quite yet. Um, we do have a second space that we're planning to open at some point this year, but we haven't set a date, um, which is the Angel Island Immigration Museum. And that is telling more comprehensive stories of Pacific migration, uh, historic as well as contemporary. So we're, um, you know, as Raul was saying, we are looking at these spaces as places to come together, talk about contemporary issues, give people uh, access to the, this historic context, but to take it those next steps, right? So we learn about history, not just so that we memorize facts and dates and, you know, we learn about history so that we can apply that to our lives and apply it to our futures. And so that's what we hope to accomplish with um, visitors that come to the park is give them those opportunities to spark conversations, to continue that conversation. Um, you know, if that turns into action as well, that's great. But, you know, we have to start somewhere. We have to start um, talking <laughs> and to each other. And uh, we, we hope that people use our spaces for that. Um, it's been uh, really difficult to connect with people right now. All of our programming has gone into distance learning. Um, and the, the upside of this difficult time is we've actually been able to reach more schools than we typically would when we are open. And that is because of the restrictions of ferries and transportation costs and physically getting here. Um, we can typically give three programs a day in person. Um, with the distance learning, we've been doing at least four programs a day and an additional day of the week than our normal uh, in-person programming. So that's been one of the, the benefits is this increased opportunity to talk to people who are looking for these conversations and wanting to know more about um, our history. Thanks, Casey. Rahul, Gigi, any additional closing thoughts before we start to wrap up? Um, I, I would like to say that, I mean, just to pick up on something that Rahul said, that when museums come together, you can, be, you can create spaces for reconciliation, even within your own museums. But the solidarity between museums and memory spaces is also very important. And I see that it gives me hope when I see and hear uh, see you guys talking and, and coming together and hear about members trying to you know, collaborate and learn uh, ways to better accommodate their communities and, and attend to the needs of these communities and, and together attend to needs of a greater community because the issues are so profound and so complicated out, outside in the world right now. The issue of systemic racism is one that is so um, so connected to migration and so deeply ingrained into everything that only really coming together of all sides and, and from all walks of life, we're going to get somewhere. So that's what I would like to see more of this collaboration and initiatives like, you know, participatory curatorial um, uh, approaches are amazing to accommodate the needs of of new migrants and, and people suffering racism today, which is how we learn from the past to now serve the communities that are in need today. So that's, um, I'd love to hear, I, I love hearing all the work you, you guys presented today. And I just hope we keep exchanging more and more and learning from each other to do greater good. Um, Ed, may I say something quickly? Yes, go ahead, Raul. Um, I, I, I think Gigi 
Um, <laughs> that reconciliation, that part of the, the movement, that's also inward facing for us. Because depending on the generation, depending on the, gener the, the, the generation of immigrant, when you've come into this country and under what circumstances you've come, if you're coming in with the tech boom, you have a disconnect with um, racialized America, but you do have connection to racialized and colorist India and uh, the, the, the communal separations that are pretty much ingrained, you know? And so we've had to figure out how to break through to get that idea of equating, say, uh, anti-Blackness with white supremacy, that if you are a brown person like myself and you are spewing anti-Blackness, you are upholding white supremacy. Well, by the same token, you have some populations coming in from China or Japan now who um, have brought with them very modern understanding and ingrained uh, racialization of themselves as in this hierarchy of, well, I'm not black, so I must be white. Or class becomes, I'm not black because I've got wealth and affluence. Well, if the distinction is always, I'm not black, count me in, I'm black. Because in terms of my understanding of the way that this country is pushed forward. I've taken my learning and my knowledge from the teachers within Black and Latino and Native communities, but also the same Asian Americans who were fighting during World War II against the incarceration all the way till now, and those radical, amazing Chinese workers who were organizing in the 1800s despite the racist structure of the union system here. So there are so many messages that we have to get through that the colorism and the racism within our own communities is really thick. And the museum has been dedicated to dealing with that, but we really had to double down. We really had to say, we're not doing it well, not well enough. And we are pushing ourselves and it's um, necessary, but really it, it, it can be very contentious. That's the work you got to do, right? Exactly. And uh, as we as in the Asian Pacific American community are uh, in these more recent months feeling this sense of anger, this sense of frustration, the sense of fear and, and lack of safety, uh, to your point, Rahul, it's important to also recognize that what we're feeling because of this racism and xenophobia and this violence pointed at our communities is not dissimilar from what our brothers and sisters in the Black community, in Native communities, in Latino, Latino, and next communities, and in Indigenous communities have felt as well. And so hopefully we can develop this co more common sense of understanding and empathy for each other's histories and journeys, but also how intertwined our futures are. And part of the power, I think, of, of bringing together art and history, just as how each of us have described, is that opportunity to hopefully help people understand, to help people empathize. And so we wanted to close out today's session with uh, a opportunity to highlight uh, an intersection of art and history. This is a piece that we can't take credit for at the Angel Island Immigration Station, Station Foundation, but it is a piece that was written by a recent Yale graduate while he was in college. Uh, it's a rap musical, a piece from his rap musical called Illegal, and it's based on his grandfather's detention through Angel Island. So I want to play uh, uh, one of the pieces from his his musical. And I do want to forewarn people that uh, if you have children in the room watching with you, there is a very brief instance of profanity that is included in, in the piece. But I'll let Skylar Chin, who is the co-creator of Illegal, share with you a little bit more about the piece and that'll lead straight into, into his, his piece called Interrogation. Hey everyone, my name is Skylar Chin and I'm the creator of Illegal, a new musical. I want to thank Ed for featuring one of our songs today. It's called Interrogation. 
the song is a dramatized rap battle version of an Angel Island interrogation. And the words and the questions you're about to hear are actually directly taken from my own grandfather's transcript from 1923 when he was detained at Angel Island. If you like what you see, and if you're interested in hearing more about Illegal, uh, you can visit my website, www.skylarchin.com. We're actually doing a virtual tour right now for uh, Stop Asian Hate and AAPI Heritage Month. So I hope to see you there. Thanks. Interrogation of applicant number 724. Interpreter is Carter Lee. You were advised your right to admission to this country will be today considered by this board. The regulations state that if your answers to these questions do not match those of your alleged father, William Wong, you will be denied entry to the U.S. Applicant number 724 sworn. State your name, your age, and your place of birth. Fat Port 21, USA for what it's worth. Married? No. Siblings? State One. their name and whereabouts. Devin Wong, New York. Did you leave any siblings out? Nope. Grandparents still alive? No. Where's your grandpa buried? <laughs> With my grandmother. Kid? Which cemetery? Valhalla. New York? Man, they're trying to break my ball. Now China. How tall are the walls? Dad sleeps upstairs. Whose house is on the left? We call him Captain So. What's his sister's name? The friend. She's General So. <laughs> Does the street have a dead end? Nope. Where do you live in the States? Chinatown. Why are you here now? Went to China, now I'm back. Must have been a few years now. Have you ever been to Pike Street? Yes. Describe your last trip. The street food! Did you leave a cash tip? <laughs> no. How far in what direction? East. This is so bad. Which food truck did you go to? I didn't know I had to know that. What kind of pavement leads that way? Dark. That's not what your father stated. Probably because we're on the border and borders are complicated. Next question. As part of your application, list the partners doing commerce in this fine, fine nation. Sam Kai Chung, William Wong, and my younger brother Devin got like three to four cousins. There should uh, be more than seven. What's your role in the company? Huge. Your father says that isn't true. You could have been deceived. Just had to check, didn't you? Any others in China? No, we're American. There must be. Yeah, I got them all. You can trust me. Uh, you? Some dumb guy? Something wrong with you? That's enough. These people don't want me here. These questions are just designed to pin you. My dad and me, we can't agree on what we had for dinner. Yo, what kind of crap questions next in this dialogue? What is the name and location of your neighbor's sister's dog? The fuck? Applicant 724, is that the name or the location? How is it you don't agree with your own father regarding the name of your neighbor's sister's dog? <laughs> Yo, just let me in, I'm his son, I'm so done. Check please, you're making up these complicated questions to get me deported. Inspector, you think you're some kind of sleuth? Then how come you can't tell that I'm just telling the truth? Either your pants on fire or your dad's a liar. Heck, not even a cheat sheet could make your chances higher. You ain't the son of a merchant, nor a fine gentry. Can't prove it, I move that you're denied entry. Hey, uh... So I want to thank Skylar. I would like to thank Gigi, Casey, Rahul, and our, our colleagues at all of the US uh, museums and sites with the Global Migration Museums Network, which includes the National Arab American Museum, Tenement House, the Wing Luke Museum, the Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island. Um, and we are just so excited to have had the opportunity to, to share this program with you and want to wish everyone a happy, a safe, and a healthy Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. Thank you, everyone.